Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, learners, spurners and memoir burners, welcome along to the Joe Spivey YouTube channel where we discuss books and little else. And welcome back to another instalment of, of our inaugural read-along here on the Joe Spivey YouTube channel, uh, where we are going through a child Spivey's pilgrimage, no less. We are looking at the lives, times, transgressions, virtues, difficulties, stanzas, contretemps of the sixth Lord Baron Baron of Newstead between the years of 1788 and 1824, uh, otherwise known more colloquially as simply Lord Byron, chief and most illustrious of uh, romantic poets. Now, uh, this is just the final section of our uh, Fiona uh, McCarthy's biography. We are going to be uh, uh, teaming this with some of the sections of his works later on, but we're just, we're just dealing with the biography for now. Uh, yeah, this is the final section entitled The Byronic Cult. It's only 100 pages or so. I think it may even be less than that, 70 pages or something of that, like that description. Um, and yeah, she... she, she uh, briefly goes over uh, what happens after his death. We saw that he died a very unlordly, uh, uh, t uh, untimely and completely avoidable death. Um, he was, yeah, it, it, it wasn't, it was very undignified, exudative diarrhea and, um, you know, bloodletting and all of that. So he, he perishes. Um, his, the, the corpse, as it were, um, the, the cadaver is um, preserved with, with spirits and is sort of coffined. Uh, I mean alcoholic spirits and not um, harrowing ones. And uh, yeah, it's eventually shipped back to Britain. Hobhouse and Medwin, I believe, are, you know, obviously one of some of his two, certainly his, his two chroniclers and primary friends. Um, Medwin was more of a Boswell than a friend. Um, they, they see it and say that it's unrecognisable. The corpse is all shriveled and um, yada, yada, yada. Some people say that it is, um, you know, a, a, a great corpse of poise and that the lips are divine and that, you know, you would very much expect him just to rear up at any given moment. Um, but the, obviously there's a procession, the, 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 the coffin is paraded through London and right the way up to Nottingham. I believe it's Hucknall where he is uh, uh, buried now and of course there are sort of lots of uh, 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 cultish, uh, yeah, cultish tributes. I don't know whether it's sort of Diana-esque, whether there are flowers being thrown on the streets and, and, and people are crying in the gutters. Lady Caroline Lamb and, and Lady Webster and Lady Blessington, all the people that, whose hearts he and minds he touched are, uh, uh, make sure to remark of it in their diary. They see him from the window. Um, and then um, she broaches the subject of the memoir burning, uh, as I alluded to in my, my melodic introduction just today. Um, it is, for my thinking, and indeed Fiona McCarthy's, every other bit of uh, uh, information that I've, I've gleaned from this, it is the most self-interested and uh, 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 obvious desecration of something which would be of great value to all literary historians and readers in general. Imagine if Byron's entire memoirs, which he had been, I think, starting in 1908, uh, 1808, 1809 or 8, when he was sort of 21, right the way through the rest of his life, Half of it is supposedly quite uh, salacious and quite, um, uh, 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 as is you know much of Byron's uh, 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 sort of private exchanges are typified. Is 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 really rather uh, interested in the carnal, uh, but apparently the next part is sort of a little bit of a damp squib or maybe uninteresting. Uh, then she talks about yeah the Byronic cult and some of its uh, acolytes and detractors. Um, you have. Pushkin, who I think even references Byron in bits of Eugene Onegin. I haven't even I haven't even read any of that, so I'm not going to to seek to um, yeah, elucidate you on that. Um, but but uh, uh, she cites Bronte as as probable obvious admirers of Byron's. Uh, obviously the um, past sexual transgressions and the um, the imposing physical figures and the um, weird raifish attractiveness of both. Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights and Rochester in Jane Eyre, all of those contribute, are, are said to be um, at least somewhat inspired by, um, you know, by Romania, which so swept the nation. And who else have we got that, that Fiona McCarthy is interested in? Alfred Lord Tennyson is, is distraught upon hearing as a very, as a young boy, a sort of adolescent, I think Tennyson would have been in 1824, that Byron has passed. Um, and so, yeah, it says that there are many, many Byronic fingerprints um, on uh, on his watch. And uh, yeah, I do think it is very, very difficult to understate just how, uh, it might be easy to overstate just how uh, influential Mr. Mr. B has been. Um, but yeah, I, I would need to know a little bit more about him. I need to get a few more biographies under my belt before, before properly going into that. Uh, interestingly enough, 
T.S. Eliot and Virginia Woolf are uh, the most notable and uh, prominent dissenters, or, or at least criticizers or critics. Um, they they uh, cite some of his uh, presumably self-contrived lugubriousness or lugubriosity. Um, they think he's a little bit of an impetuous, uh, 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 impertinent, lazy individual. Um, somebody, some you know, some some creature of affectation who, who only cared about his reputation and what people thought of him, uh, whose poetry was passable. Um, a bit rich coming from Mr. Eliot, who um, seemed not seemed to be a uh, somebody incapable of rhyming words. But there we are. Um, so I've got plenty of sections that I want to highlight. Um, just first of all, uh, it, it, it was a little bit infantilising when we were in year seven and year eight and year nine when teachers used to do this, but uh, when they used to put a big picture of Queen Elizabeth I down, for example, and she'd have her hand on the globe and we'd, we'd try and decipher what it was that the artist was trying to connote in there. Um, but this is, uh, we might as well do a similar exercise here. This is the, 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 the picture on the, on the front of um, Fiona McCarthy's Life and Legend. So you've got obviously the R, which is a, a sort of striking underlining sabre there. I think that's obviously self-conscious. That's not part of the portrait, Joe. Uh, then we've got uh, the, the, the Albanian, is it the Albanian headdress? The, the, the Greek or Albanian headdress. Uh, lots of the uh, gorgeous uh, silken robes and things. And then you've got the actual sabre there, safely scabbarded um, in the sheath. Um, but yeah, it, what does he look? Does he look, I think he looks contemplative. I think he, lo he looks actually quite frozen there and quite deer-like, doesn't he? He looks like he's focusing really hard on the beetle climbing the wall rather than um, trying to imbue himself or trying to, to carry off himself in any stately regard. But um, yeah, I think it's an interesting portrait to have on the front. Um, it is uh, yeah, Thomas Phillips from ages and ages ago, essentially. Uh, sixth Baron Baron. Right then, let's get into the stuff I've highlighted. So uh, this is talking about some of the, uh, yeah, where it was he was placed, uh, where, the, where the body was placed. Stan Hope saw in his imagination that Britons who cherish genius and who love liberty will, I doubt, will, I I doubt not crowd to the banks of the Thames. At the beginning of July, the Times and other London newspapers announced that Lord Byron's remains would be deposited in Poets' Corner in the Abbey. This was not to happen. Although the general tone of the newspaper announcements of his death had been guardedly forgiving, acrimony and, and suspicion still lingered, John Bull, for example, reminding its leaders that Lord Byron had quitted the world at the most unfortunate period of his career and in the most unsatisfactory manner, in voluntary exile, where his mind, debased by evil associations and the malignant brooding over imaginary ills, has been devoted to the construction of elaborate lampoons. Um, oh, that's rich coming from somebody who just wrote out an elaborate lampoon, as I'm sure you can tell. Um, next we've got... Uh, we don't need to talk about that section, actually. That's not altogether relevant. Uh, next up we have talk of um, him, what, what am I talking about here? Uh, sorry guys, I'm, I am prepared, I promise I am conscientious. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, many of the great Victorians, many of the people we've come to think of as the great Victorians were addicted to Byron in their youth. In 1824, the 14 year old uh, Alfred Tennyson, in the 14 year old Alfred Tennyson inscribed the words, Byron is dead, into the soft sandstone of a rock near his father's rectory at Summersby in Lincolnshire. He remembered it as a day when the whole world seemed to be darkened for me. At school he had hated Horace and loved Byron. Byron expressed what I felt. Uh, and I think that's a, a very common theme of Byron. He, he, he seems to exhume uh, those almost universal truths which we hold, um, and yet stylized it and formalized it and romanticized it in, in such alluring and um, yeah, hospitable poetry. Uh, next up we have um, his thematic slash novelistic progeny, which is what I've written here. Uh, in the Bronte sisters' novels, the Byronic hero, the flawed angel, the man of demoniac attractiveness, emerged with a compelling imaginative power. In Bronte's Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff is the Byron figure, the tall, athletic, well-formed man, yada yada. There are Byronic hints of incest in the love between Heathcliff and Catherine, and then we go, uh, in, in Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, the saturnine hero, Mr. Rochester, is Byronic in his past sexual transgressions, his doomed marriage, the secret horror of the mad woman hidden in the attic, his arrogant attempt to inveil Jane into an illegal wedding, yada yada. Um, and then we've got one of the final uh, bits that I wanted to highlight here. This is about W. H. Auden and some of his, uh, some of the other acolytes that we've talked about, and some of the detractors. In the 20th century, Byron's continuing physical presence was felt even by those who most disliked him. T. S. Eliot complained of Byron as sculpted by Thor Waldson, that weakly sensual mouth, that restless triviality of expression, and most of all, that kind of look of self-conscious beauty. Uh, and there is that. Uh, inescapable notion with Byron that obviously cultivated his own celebrity and was um, rather childishly um, 
dependent on the fascination and admiration of others and really did care very much about what other people thought about him. Uh, uh, to Virginia Woolf writing to Lytton Strecky, uh, Byron seemed tawdry and melodramatic and Claire and Tarani and so on and so on and so on. I conceive them like a cave at some Earl's Court exhibition. A grotto, I mean, lined with distorted mirrors and plastered with oyster shells. Quite apart from his poetry, Byron himself aroused an evident physical distaste. Conversely, those who loved him could easily resummon him in all his idiosyncratic splendour. W. H. Auden, for example, treated Byron as if he were still alive. In 36, 1936, Auden booked a passage on a ship from Hull to Iceland. Uh, on the five-day voyage, he read Don Dewan, uh, yada yada. I suddenly thought I might write him a chatty letter uh, in light verse about anything I could think of, Europe, literature and myself. So he's got really very, very many fans, um, and the Byronic... Is it, I'm not sure whether it's a cult, I think that's just a rather attention-grabbing title from Miss McCarthy. But yeah, overall this biography is, uh, I think I called it at the start, it is a reread. Uh, I called it perfectly serviceable at the start, and that pretty much stands to reason, I think. Um, what aspects of Byron do we want to talk about more? Uh, obviously I've got the works to get through, and we've got um, many of his amorous escapades to, to, to rehash, and to relive, and to reanalyse. Um, but I think that just about does it for life and legend, folks. Um, yeah, we're going to be going. We're going to do it chronologically. So we're going to be going from Hours of Idleness to uh, English Bards and Scotch Reviewers, and then to Child Harold. But it's all available on the net, and it's all free of charge. So uh, I'm pretty much going to run out of time on this recording, folks. So I'm going to thank you ever so much for watching BookTube, and say goodbye.